little round of applause for managing that. I'm sorry. We are beginning a new series on suffering. I'm sure if I could just move just across just a little bit more, if that's okay. We are beginning a new series on suffering. And I didn't mean to inflict suffering on the poor Bible reader today, um, but well done to that. That's a real challenge to do that. So, yeah, we'll be looking at that a bit in a moment. Let's, as we begin today, let's pray. Father, we pray that as we come before your word, we may so hear it to live lives worthy of you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, in my first few weeks here at Northcote Baptist Church, I've been struck by the challenges and suffering that many of us have had to face throughout our lives, or indeed at the present. I've, as I've met people and heard stories, I've met people who have lost children in tragic circumstances, I've had siblings, parents or relatives have been lost unexpectedly. Gunmen have been running into our offices. There's coronavirus, sickness, disease. And then there's even bigger challenges of the war in Ukraine, a shooting in Texas. The list just goes on and on. So how do we reconcile these experiences, these tragedies, this, this suffering with the good God of the Bible? Many years ago, I had a conversation with an older woman in a shopping centre in Sydney. I was on a bench preparing a Bible study and she sat down next to me. And uh, I, I know I didn't say anything. I don't think I was being rude. But I was just sitting there reading the Bible and minding my own business when she saw the Bible and then she asked me if I was a Christian. I said that I was and she asked me why. And before I could say anything, she said, I can't believe in God. There's too much suffering in the world. Now, I didn't really have a chance to respond or, or say anything. To her, suffering meant that she couldn't believe in God. And at her age, she's probably seen and experienced some suffering in her life. Indeed, famed naturalist and Sir David Attenborough said he couldn't believe in God because he thinks of a little boy sitting on the banks of a river in West Africa with a worm boring through his eyeball turning him blind before he's five years old. Now, this, I don't mean to be a trigger alert or anything, but this, this photo might be a little bit disturbing, perhaps. Hopefully it comes up. Oh, I lost my... All right, we're right. There we go. Anyway, um, now I had Raponda's God, who presumably made this worm, which can only live by boring in people's eyes, and he concludes, I don't find that compatible with the Christian idea of a God who cares individually for the welfare of each of us. Now it's a powerful argument and hence the problem of pain and suffering and evil in the world is many is one that many can't reconcile with a good God or indeed any God. In fact Bart Ehrman who's a popular New Testament scholar has written many books criticizing the Christian faith including misquoting Jesus the story behind who changed the Bible and why. Now his works are very popular amongst atheists who attempt to demonstrate the inaccuracy of the Bible. Yet, and, and in fact, they love, atheists love to share Ehrman's deconversion story, his movement from being a committed evangelical to an agnostic. Yet interestingly, Bart Ehrman says that it wasn't his New Testament scholarship that changed his mind. Instead, it was the problem of evil and suffering. He couldn't reconcile a good God with the evil and the suffering that he observed in the world. And the issue of the silence or inactivity of God amidst pain and suffering is a very real question to many. And it's only been heightened in recent years by, as we've battled in Australia, catastrophic bushfires, unrest in the US, a war in Ukraine, and now most significantly the most significant global pandemic for 100 years. So welcome to a series of suffering. We're going to spend the next five weeks exploring the big question of pain and suffering in our world. And I'm hoping that these messages won't be overly painful. But in the coming weeks, we're going to consider why there is suffering and the, how do the Bible responds to suffering and how we live in light of suffering. And today is like an introductory message in some ways. We're going to start with the problem itself and consider some approaches that people have had to try to solve it. Then I'm going to propose a slightly different way 
of looking at the problem and as we look at the genealogy of Matthew's gospel, which may seem a bit bizarre perhaps, but it will help us illuminate, I think, some fascinating reflections on the problem of evil and suffering and how the God of the Bible approaches it. So let's begin. Five weeks of pain and suffering. And so let's start with the problem itself. Because the logical problem of evil is an ancient problem. It actually goes back to the Greek philosopher Epicurus, uh, who lived 341 to 270 BC. Now he was the first one to articulate this problem. And the problem is actually in the form of an argument. It's a series of propositions which is usually framed something like this. I'll just go through it. Firstly, God is all-powerful. Second, God is all-loving. Third, evil exists in a world created by this God. Now here comes the problem. If God is all-powerful, then he could eliminate evil. If he's all-loving, he would eliminate evil. However, since evil exists in this world, it must mean that God either isn't all-powerful or all-loving, and therefore God must be impotent, wicked, or perhaps imaginary. Do you see the problem? I think it's a substantial problem for Christian faith, and it's actually convinced some very smart people. Now, the attempt to solve this problem of evil has occupied philosophers for centuries. Many have attempted to resolve this intellectual problem of evil. Now, I found one uh, Christian philosopher in an essay in a book entitled The Problem of Evil and Reasonable Christian Responses. Now, the essay was coherently written and it gave a philosophically sound response. And he proposed two philosophical reasons for why God permits evil. He said that evil is necessary for character development and evil is necessary for free will. First, he says that evil is necessary for character development. Uh, now, I think this is a common, common experience of, which, uh, of life which I'm sure resonates with us. I'm sure they say that we're, you know, we're all better for having periods of suffering in our lives. You know, there's so much to say that the great German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche says, what doesn't kill you will make you stronger. So we're, I'm sure that we can all agree that you know, we're better people at times for having suffered. We're more resilient, more patient, more empathetic, more determined. We're stronger. So hence the argument goes that evil is necessary, therefore, to grow our character, to char for character development. But the second philosophical defence here offered is the free will defence, and it's, it's, which is different from the movie Free Willy. Just want to make sure that's yeah, clear. Yeah, free will defence, as that free will is what makes it possible for people to be morally good or evil. You, the argument goes that you can't have good or evil without a choice. Now, this has been made famous by the philosopher Alvin Plantinga in a deceptively small book called God, Freedom and Evil, which he claims that the world in which there is suffering is the best of all possible worlds. Now, there are many philosophers who actually believe that the free will defence actually works, that it does provide a philosophical solution to the problem of evil as described. But whilst there's definitely merit and truth to these ideas, I feel that there's a couple of problems with this approach. My main difficulty with these is that evil somehow becomes necessary or even a good. Because I think this is problematic, as I think that we should always regard evil and suffering as always evil and wrong. And then also you could also ask, furthermore, you could also ask, okay, well, so how much suffering does God need to permit to make it justifiable? It's unclear how much suffering actually becomes necessary. And for some, suffering does seem disproportionate and unrelated to human will or decision. So I think that the problem of evil doesn't have easy answers. But my biggest problem with this approach, with this philosophical approach here, is, it's, is mainly its method. The author of this essay has used philosophy to work out why God would allow suffering. And I think there's some merit to that, absolutely. But I think this approach is somewhat flawed. Why, 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 why is that? Okay. Well, let's ask a prior and even bigger question, perhaps. How do I know anything about God? It's a really big question. I think it's important for us to ask. How do I know about God? Well, to answer that, I'm going to ask you a very, very big question, which will help us. It's a very, very profound question. Okay, now just be ready. What's my favourite colour? 
Anyone want? <laughs> it's not. But anyway, I'll, okay, I'll ask another one. What was the name of my first pet? <laughs> it wasn't. So that's wrong. Sorry, Ray. Yes. Okay, the third one. Okay, third big question that really will help us understand this. Where did I start school? And I'll give you a clue. It wasn't that school. Um, <laughs> I didn't start at school at Hogwarts. Now don't, now, don't, now, don't, now, don't get me wrong here. I don't have any pretensions of grandeur here. I don't think for a second that I'm God. But my point is that the only way that we can know these things, my favourite colour, the name of my first pet, where I started school, is if what? I tell you. Exactly. I tell them to you if I reveal them to you. So I think it's the same with God. We can only know him and know things about him if he tells us something about himself. Now there's some things that we can understand and sort of gather from the world around us. You know, we can kind of infer about God. But the only way that we can be certain about what God is, who God is and what he's done is if we know if he, if he has revealed himself. So this is, I think, a really crucial point. So how has, so we need, only know about God unless he's revealed himself. And here's the really hard question. So how has God revealed himself? Well, he's revealed himself in all sorts of different ways. But the book of Hebrews 1 talks, reveals it, it makes it very clear. He says, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom also he made the universe. So in the past, God did speak in many and various ways. He spoke through prophets. He used dreams, visions, signs, angels. It, I don't, there's no recorded instances of tea leaves, but he used these varieties of different communications that have been recorded for us in the scriptures. And this is why the Bible, the scriptures, are so important. God speaks to us through them. If we want to know God, we read the Bible. But Hebrews is also saying that God has spoken most profoundly and most definitively through his Son. Jesus is the ultimate point in God's revelation to us. Jesus is the primary and the best way in which we know God. John 1.18 says, No one has ever seen God, but God the one and only, who is at the Father's side, that is Jesus, has made him known. So some ask, well, why is God so hidden? Well, if you'd lived 2,000 years ago, you went to Palestine, you could have shaken his hand. You could have given him a high five, perhaps, or maybe an elbow bump, perhaps today. You could have eaten with him, drunk with him, tried to teach him cricket, maybe sung an Elvis song for him. You could have met God. God has revealed himself through Jesus. God became flesh and lived among us. So the best way to know anything about God is if he reveals it to us. And God has revealed himself most comprehensively through the person and works of Jesus. So maybe then we could think, couldn't maybe this be the starting point, therefore, to resolve complex questions of the Christian faith? Rather than starting with philosophy, why not explore how God solves suffering as has been revealed to us? So to answer the problem of how a loving and powerful God could allow pain and suffering in the world, why don't we ask Jesus? Ask the one who came as God in flesh into our world. New York Times best-selling author Tim Keller captures this idea in his book Encounters with Jesus, where someone once asked him the question, he says, why can't you give me a watertight argument for the existence of God? And Keller responded by saying, well, what if God didn't send us a watertight argument, but a watertight person, Jesus Christ, against whom in the end there can be no argument? Jesus comes to be the answer to our deep questions so this then becomes our project in these five weeks for this series jesus versus suffering we're going to look at the gospel of matthew a gospel which begins with the theme of god with us god come to dwell with us and reveal himself and so what we're going to do is we're going to look through the gospel of matthew and see how jesus approaches suffering what he tells us about it how he responds with it how he deals with it how he experiences it so let's ask Jesus our hard and difficult questions. So Jesus, why is there suffering in the world? And maybe he might have answers for Sir David Attenborough, the woman I met on the bench, or for skeptics like Bart Herman. 
So as we then start this series, in today's introductory message, I thought, well, why don't we start by looking at the opening sentences to the Gospel of Matthew, the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew 1 to 17. And it wasn't simply just to make the Bible reader struggle and have a difficult time. Because a genealogy is a family history, and it can be a real battle to know the names. So what I thought I'd do, just something a little bit different, mid-message today, is I thought I'd share, I'd share a, sorry, this is a bad tongue twister. I thought I'd share a short song which might help. Now some of you, a um, number of last month, might have met our friend Will, who visited us here from New South Wales um, in our, I think our second week here. Well, he's actually written a song about this passage, and he's also got some Appalachian cloggers to help him out to perform this. So it's, it's a little whimsical, but it only goes for a couple of minutes, but I thought we might play it right now, if that's okay, Peter. And I hope you enjoy this reflection on um, Matthew 1 to, 8, 1 to 17. And also keep your Bibles open because I'm going to ask you a question about what Will does as we finish. So thanks. Oh, in chapter 1 of the Gospel of Matt, many, 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 many men begat. Abraham begat, Isaac begat, Jacob begat, many men begat. Judah begat, Perez begat, Hezron begat, and Ram begat. His son Aminadab begat, Nashon begat, Salmon begat. Boaz begat, Obed begat, Jesse begat, David begat, Solomon begat, Rehoboam begat, Abijah begat, Asa begat. Jehoshaphat, Fat Fat begat, Jehoram begat, Aziah begat, Jotham begat, Ahaz begat, Hezekiah begat, Manasseh begat. Amon begat, Josiah begat, Jeconiah begat, Shealtiel begat, Zerubbabel begat, Abihud and Eliakim begat. Azor begat, Zadok begat, Akim begat, Elihud begat, Eliezer he sure did begat, Matan begat, Jacob begat. And last of all, I think it's at verse 18 of the Gospel of Matt, the Lord, the Holy Ghost, begat the little baby Jesus Christ. How about that? I hope no, you enjoyed that. That's certainly a different perspective on the Gospel of Matt and the genealogy. So as Will's song helpfully shows, genealogy is a description of Matthew's descendants. Uh, sorry, of Jesus' descendants. Matthew's gene- genealogy shows that Jesus is descended from Abraham the one to whom the promises of nationhood are given. It also shows that Jesus is descended from the kingly line of Judah through the great kings of David and Solomon. But as delightful and whimsical as Will's song is, did anyone notice what did he leave out? Did anyone notice what did he leave out of the song from what we read in the passage? Does anyone... Anyone... Anyone? What did he leave out? Big chair test. He didn't. Well, it wasn't just Mary. He also didn't. Leave, he left out all the names of the women of the genealogy, and also a few others. If you, a few others. So what he did, which is very clever, if you, if you look closely, well, if, if the list of the names we notice that Matthew's genealogy is based on a pattern. X was the father of Y. Hence, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel. Shealtiel, the father of Zerubbabel, and so on. And that's basically what Will's song showed. But the pattern is broken in a few places in the genealogy. If you have a look at it in, front, in Matthew 1, you can see there's a couple of additional people and noticeably women added to the genealogy which breaks this pattern. So as if you look in there in verse 2, Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. Verse 3, and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Verse 5, Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Uh, verse 5, Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Verse 6, King David. 
Verse 6, Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Verse 11, Josiah, the father of Jeconiah, and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. And verse 16, Joseph, husband of Mary, as Ray has pointed out. So why do you think the author would do this? Wouldn't it be easier just to make it more poetic and simple just by running through the names, perhaps to say, Will Song's done? So why would he break the pattern? Well, I think it's to reveal and highlight something special, something important. And this genealogy does include five women, which is strange. Yet stranger still is that four of these women are not Israelites. Tamar was a daughter of a Canaanite woman. Rahab was a Canaanite living in the land of Jericho. Ruth was a Moabite. And the mother of Solomon Bathsheba was married to Uriah, who was a Hittite. These foreign women are the unexpected ones through whom God works. Non-Israelite women were the ancestors of Jesus, king of Israel, God's king. This is surprising and unexpected and gives us maybe a little glimpse that God works through the unexpected in unexpected ways to bring about his purposes and his plans. But it also shows that maybe the God of the Bible perhaps doesn't always fit our convenient philosophical categories. Some say that God's a misogynist, yet women here are mentioned as being crucial in bringing about God's purposes. Epicurus claims that evil cannot exist in a world created by an all-powerful God, yet closer examination of these stories summarised in this genealogy shows that suffering has actually formed a part of the purposes and the plans of God, perhaps making the problem of evil too simple and philosophically convenient. So what we'll do is just dive in just very quickly to a couple of these glimpses in this genealogy, a couple of points where Matthew has broken his pattern to perhaps reveal something about God and his purposes. And so we can see, um, oh that was the video, it didn't work. Oh there we go. So verse 2, so Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. The brothers here are the 12 brothers, they're famous, they form the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, Judah is significant in the purposes of Matthew's genealogy because he was the one with the royal promises. He was the the one to become the royal king. But Matthew here refers to his brothers, which I think is a way of acknowledging the significance of the 12, the 12 tribes in the history of Israel. And this alludes to the particular significance of Joseph in bringing about the purposes and plans of God. Indeed, through Joseph the nation of Israel was saved. Yet Joseph's story is one, if you're aware of it, it's the last part of the book of Genesis, you start the story of Joseph. His story is one of suffering and misfortune. He was disowned by his own brothers and thrown down a well. He was then sold to a slave owner and passed off as dead and taken to a foreign land in Egypt. In Egypt, he was then falsely accused by Potiphar's wife. And so Joseph, one of Judah's brothers, suffered unjustly but Judah and his brothers also suffered so for whilst Joseph was in Egypt a terrible famine came upon the land hence it was the suffering of the hunger and the threat of starvation which brought Judah and his brothers to Egypt to buy grain and to be reunited with Joseph so through an awful situation and through much pain and suffering God brought good thus so that the whole episode of Joseph concludes in Genesis 50 19 to 20, where Joseph says to his brothers, Don't be afraid, am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. This is intriguing. God here has revealed himself. He has used suffering to bring about his purposes, to save his people. And this incident challenges Epicurus, for an all-powerful and all-loving God has allowed evil in its various guises, brotherly cruelty, unjust accusations, famine, hunger, for his purposes. So God has allowed or even used this evil for his plan. So rather than being a clear defeater to the existence of God, the Bible reveals that God had a reason for allowing this evil, in this case, the saving of many lives. And we can see more about how God uses suffering in his purposes in one of the other women mentioned in verse 5 of the genealogy. In verse 5, the woman Ruth. Now if you think you've had a tough life, 
Then consider the story of Ruth. Ruth was born in a time of suffering and hardship, another famine. Her mother, Naomi, suffered a particularly hard life. Her husband died and then her three sons, one of whom married Ruth, also died. And you can feel Naomi's pain when she was left without her two sons and her husband. Poor Naomi, because here was a woman who had suffered. And Naomi reflects on her situation. And in Ruth 1.13, Naomi with tears commented that the Lord's hand has gone out against me. She saw the source of her suffering as from God himself. In fact, she no longer wanted to be called Ruth, but Mara, because God has made her life very bitter. She says in Ruth 1, 20 to 21, I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So notice here that Naomi acknowledges God being the one who bringing suffering on her, but she never questions God's existence. She never considered God imaginary. Now Naomi's reflections do raise lots of really difficult questions. Does this mean that God isn't all loving and good? Is he a bringer of disaster? Is a God a cruel God who relishes the pain and suffering of his people to bring about ultimate good? Or is it all just a bit random? We'll explore these questions in the coming weeks. We're not going to answer them all right now. But in Ruth, again, we see a bit of an enigma. Whilst God has brought real pain and suffering on Ruth, Naomi, we can see that he cares for his people. In Ruth 1.6, the Lord had come to the aid of his people by bringing food. But throughout the story of Ruth, we see, like the story of Joseph, God uses the suffering of his people to bring about his purposes, which shows us that when we listen to how God has revealed himself and his purposes through the scriptures, Suffering is a bit more complex than our convenient philosophical categories. Because if Naomi hadn't suffered, she would never have returned to our homeland Bethlehem and to Judah. If Naomi hadn't suffered, Ruth would never have met Boaz. If Naomi had never suffered, Ruth and Boaz would never have had a son called Obed. If Naomi hadn't suffered, there wouldn't have been a King David. If Naomi hadn't suffered, there wouldn't have been this genealogy and then there wouldn't have been a Jesus. God used the pain and suffering of Naomi to bring about his purposes. So here, even in this opening genealogy of Matthew, if we strip back and see some of the stories, there's just a glimpse of the, some of the stories underneath, we can see that the people in Jesus' family tree were very real and they suffered. Yet God had used the pain and suffering of these real people to bring about his purposes and to bring Jesus Now, there is a lot to say here, but at the very least, this says that suffering is not inconsistent with the existence of God. For God has used suffering, hardship and trial to bring about his purposes and plans for the world. He has a reason for evil. And I think that this brings me a sense of peace and comfort that the Bible is not a cold, hard philosophical treatise. It's a very real and a very messy book which acknowledges and connects with our experiences of suffering and pain. Biblical characters suffered far more than me and yet they can still praise God. Biblical characters experience far more trying circumstances than myself and they can still trust in the Lord. Hence from the tiny glimpses we've seen already of the Bible, the Bible itself acknowledges suffering as the reality of our experience and it doesn't see suffering as a reason to reject God. So let's, as we begin this series, let's consider what God has told us about suffering and its problem. How does a good God respond to suffering and how does he deal with it? Well, in the next four weeks, let's ponder, read, think and I'll give you a clue. There is good news in the end and I think some very strong responses to people like Sir David Attenborough we haven't got time to explore all this today so we'll have time in the next week so we have to come back next week as we continue exploring but let's finish today with the words of Joseph from Genesis 50 20 which shows that the Bible is not unaware of the reality of suffering and evil where Joseph said to his brothers you intended to harm me 
But God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Amen. Let's pray. Father, as we look through your word, as you've revealed it to us and you, who you are and your purposes and plans for this world, we see that you have used the real and messy and painful experiences of people over many centuries. And we resonate with their experiences and understand that, that suffering is complex and difficult, but you have used it to bring about your purposes and your good. Please help us to not regard it, suffering as a, as a good, therefore, and it should be enjoyed and, and relished, but for it to acknowledge the hardship and the reality of life in this world. Um, but that you have used that to bring about your purposes and that through that we can understand more about who you are and how you'll come to resolve these really big questions. So, Father, in the coming weeks, please may you help us to think as we confront, see how Jesus confronts suffering and understand more fully you and your purposes in this world, and we can live to your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's have Please grab, grab, grab a seat. Well, that concludes our first week of suffering. Hopefully it wasn't too painful for us all. Um, we're going to spend some time catching up after now, now and to say hello to someone as you might not know, but uh, let's close with a final prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today and we thank you for um, revealing yourself through your word. We thank you that you have spoken to us today, particularly through the genealogy of Matthew. And may we go from here knowing that while suffering is still a painful reality of our world, we know that there is a God with us who cares and who understands it and knows our suffering and indeed has used it for his purposes in this world to transform us to your glory. And may we go from here empowered by your spirit to live and do all things to you and your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, have a great week and we we'll look forward to seeing you back here next week for round two as we continue <laughs> suffering. Thank you.